by the voice of two or three witnesses, let every word be established is what the Word of God says. And I don't know about you all, but when I gave my heart to the Lord, I was broken. I, I, I didn't know about denominations. I didn't care about denominations. I just knew I needed help. And I heard where I could get it from. Amen. And I ran to him. And I sought him in that word. Because I wanted to know what would please such a savior that would save a wretch like me. And as I sought him, he showed me what he said that he would show Jeremiah like he continues to show me and each of us continually great things that you have never known. And he's looking to show us some more things. If I could title this today, I would title it that there's a purpose. There's a purpose behind the pain. And I thank God for what I feel in here today. There is liberty. There is freedom. There is anointing in this place. There's a greater stirring in this house right now with what I feel here. And I don't base everything on feeling. But there's a greater stirring here today than what there ever was at that pool of Bethesda. And it's not just the first one to step in. It's to whosoever will. Let him come and let him drink of the waters of the life freely. He's looking to give to each and every single one of us tonight. And I thank the Lord for it. If you've got your Bibles, if we want to go through a trip through the Gospels and through the books of the Bible, the best way that I can sum it up is in Psalm 61. In verse 2, thank you, God. And in Psalm 61, verse 2, David, who wrote this psalm, we'll, we'll go ahead and start at verse 1 because it's important. He says, Hear my cry, O God, and attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. God, we ask you today that you would just move in your house. Continue, Lord, to move in your house. We know you're here, God. We know you hear our prayers, Lord. We know that you have taken every single tear, that you have bottled it up, God. That you have wrote every single striving, everything that we have done down in a book of remembrance. And Lord, we ask right now that you would just begin to open up the floodgates of heaven. Lord, rain down upon us your blessings, God. Rain your word down upon us, whether it be correction, God. Whether it be of grace, Lord, and blessing. Whether it come through fear, Lord whether it come through compassion, Lord, draw us close to you, Jesus, because you said for us to draw nigh unto you and that you would draw nigh unto us. Where you are, there is no fear. Where you are, Lord, our focal point is not up on the trials and the woes of this life, God. So let us draw near. God, Lord, take all of the fouls that the enemy has encamped around us. Drive them away from us as Abraham did of that sacrifice all those years ago and let us be in your presence today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. He said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Even David got overwhelmed. And I know what it's like to be overwhelmed at times because I've been there. I know what it's like to be overwhelmed with the trials of life and through all the uncertainties that can come along with it. But thank God I know what it's like to be overwhelmed in His precious presence, not to worry about the pains, not to worry about the woes, not to worry about the concerns that are cast and thrust upon us in this life. I know that place where all of my cares and burdens are washed away in nothing more than his presence. 
But feeling overwhelmed is something that we, I believe we can all can relate to. And it can very easily cloud and consume our thoughts, blowing things irrationally, out of proportion, and in return will even cause you to act and respond to things out of character. There's a few things I want to point out today so that we don't get caught up in the distractions of the pains and the cares of this life. We're not exempt, Brother David. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But with each sobering reminder, he encourages us. And he said, but be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. And I want somebody to understand that if you are truly a blood-bought, born-again Christian, if you have confessed your sins and confessed your faith in Jesus Christ and turned your whole heart towards Him, the Bible tells you something that you can take hold of today. He says, greater is He that is within me than He that is within the world. And if you don't have that today, you can very easily be trodden down of the devil. The Bible tells us that the devil takes people captive in this world at his own will who are not yet born again through the blood and through the spirit of Christ Jesus because truly at this moment they still belong to him. But you can break the grip that the enemy has on you today. If you're not saved in the house, if you've not confessed your sins, if you've not confessed your faith, no greater day than today to make things right with God. But today I've got you something. I've got something for the saint. And I've got something for the sinner. No matter where we stand with God today, I've got something for you. For the saint is encouragement. For the sinner is encouragement to get saved, to turn your heart finally to this God in which we know has created all of creations whose thoughts are towards you more than the sand of the sea. His thoughts are innumerable towards you. But when we look at all the things that happen in this world, it's easy to get overwhelmed sometimes. It's easy to think, God, why do you allow good, bad things to happen to good people. I read that there's none good. No, not one that the thoughts and the hearts of men are fixed upon evil continually, but he made a way for salvation. He made a way for this wicked heart that we harbor within us to be cleansed by the blood of the spotless lamb, his son, Jesus Christ, upon Calvary's cross now over 2,023 years ago. And he still has power to clean you up. He still got power to save. He still got power to give you a renewing of mind. But even to those that have received this, that have come, that have sought after him, there's still trials and afflictions. Many, the Bible says, are the afflictions of the righteous. But once again, encouragement, but God delivereth him from them all. Every single one. And I don't know about you, Brother David, but I can't think of any super saints out there. I don't know one of them. I don't have a clue where one stands. Because we read of Elijah, that mighty man of God, as he stood against the odds and faced everything as insurmountable as what it seemed on Mount Carmel. And he called for those that followed after Baal and that were prophets of the groves. Go ahead, offer up your wicked sacrifices. And he mocked them right there to that face. What boldness could be in that man except for the boldness that is given to him by the Spirit of God. And when he repaired those altars, that had been broken down, poured out what was precious in that day, which was water. They were in a drought for three and a half years and he called for the, for the God of all creation to answer by fire. He consumed everything by fire. What a man of God. And faced just after, just after a move of God as mighty as what it was, faced one of the lowest points of his life. As he heard that the death threat was made against him, he runs out into the wilderness, camps himself by the brook, 
And as he sits under a juniper tree, he requests in himself to die, saying, God, it is enough. Take my life. I've done enough. But God said, you've still got work to do. You get up and you march on because I'm not done with you yet. Just like he's not done with each and every single one of us, no matter where we stand physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritual, you're only here because he's still got something left for you. No super saints. Think of Peter, walked with the Lord, said, I'll give my life for you. I'll go even till the very end with you. Jesus said, no, you won't. You'll deny me. And it seemed like he knew exactly what he was going to do. He said, no, Lord. And when they come to take him in the garden, he draws his sword, takes off Malchus's ear. It seemed like he was truly willing to lay down his life for Jesus. And we've all got in our minds and in our preconceived notions on how God wants us to live for him. But it didn't seem like Peter had it all together. He said, I'll lay my life down for you. And Jesus said, put your sword up. That's not how you're going to lay your life down for me. You'd see later on that he would deny Jesus right to his face. But God restored him. Think of Paul. He's already mentioned it. God redeemed such a one. But he, even himself, after he was converted and began to follow after Christ, he said, wretched man am I. The things that I would do or the things that I'm not doing, the things that I'm doing or the things I wish I wouldn't do. Who shall separate me from this body of death? And then he continues right on to Romans 8.1 and he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ. I thank him that there is therefore no condemnation. The devil will come against you and try to cast condemnation upon you, try to make you think that you're not saved, try to think that you're unworthy to be saved, but God says, come anyways. Peter was such a one when he saw what Jesus could do. He knelt down on that ship after he cast out his net on the right side when Jesus told him to, and when he saw the power that, w that there was in the Son of God, he knelt down and he said, I'm not worthy. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. You don't want anything to do with someone like me. And he said, I'll make you a fisher of men. Fear not. Fear not. He wants us all. You see, even John the Baptist, he who Jesus himself said that there was not one born among women greater than he had his day. When in his time of distress, he had his disciples come and ask Jesus while John was imprisoned for standing on the truth of God's word. And he said, are you the one or do we seek another? It goes to show that even among the greatest, that there can sometimes be a doubt in our times of distress. And the unfortunate reality is that many do just what John was asking. They seek another in their time of distress. They wander away from this grace of God thinking, God, if you really love me the way that your word says that you do, would you really let me endure these things that I'm facing right now? And they begin to seek here. They begin to seek there in sexual relationships and hobbies, wandering away from the church. They look high and low and can never find it unless they come to the knowledge, just as Solomon did at the end of Ecclesiastes. It is the full duty and purpose of man to fear God and keep his commandments. For one day he will bring all things into judgment, both those things that are known and those things that are unknown. He will bring into judgment. It is a fearful thing, the Bible says, to fall into into the hands of a living God. Solomon would come to terms with this. But the unfortunate reality of many is that they seek another and never come back. Let me tell you what Jesus told John. The word in which God gave for me, or which God gave me for you today is a word of redirection of your minds, just like what he gave to John. When you're overwhelmed, it's a word of reassurance, a word to strengthen and build up on, to rekindle your confidence in God through the darkest trials that you might face in life. And where did John turn to in his time of distress? He went to the rock and Jesus reaffirmed him like he's done for me, no doubt like he's done for many of you. He said, you go tell John again, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the dead are 
are raised to life. The poor have the gospel preached unto them. And if I could just reaffirm to you today in the amount of stress and anguish that we're faced with day after day that souls are still being saved, that God is pouring revival out even up on a wicked country like what we are today. God still heals cancer. He still works miracles. He still gives beauty for ashes. He's still opening the prison doors to them that are bound, to them that are bound in depression and in anxieties. He still breaks the chains of addiction and gives hope to the suicidal. He restores the joy of his saints still today just like he did for David. He's still a wonder working God and he's still coming back to shut the mouth of every enemy that stands against the saints of God. And I wish somebody would believe it today that he can do all things if you would just believe. You know, I believe the word that Jesus sent back to John would give him all the boldness and the confidence he needed to face that chopping block as they would chop his head off because he still strengthens the weary. He still calls out to the broken hearted he still comforts those that be of a contrite and mournful spirit because that's just who he is. Amen. But how many of you know that pain sometimes is just part of the process? Amen. Some allow pain, though, to sideline them from the work of God, whether it be physical or emotional, mental, caused by illness or stress. Maybe it's anxieties or maybe for you it's the way it was for me for many years. The unfortunate reality of loneliness and betrayal and gossipers and backbiters and backstabbers. It happens. It can be a weary way sometimes. But I've seen how oftentimes, even within the church, how these trials and this pain can determine people's attitudes and outlooks on life and even their faith. They'll say, nothing's ever going to get any better. It's always been this way. I don't think anything's ever going to change. Let me tell you, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, what? All things have become new. He can make all things new in you. Sometimes pain is just part of a process that we face. But none of these things that we face in life, whether it be the signs of the times that Jesus said was coming to pass, none of these things should impact us the way that they often do. You know, the Apostle Paul not fully understanding or knowing what would befall him, but knowing this, that the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city, the Bible says, saying bonds and afflictions are before him. He said in Acts 20 verse 24, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And the problem is today we've counted our lives too dear unto ourselves, not willing to offer up our bodies that living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. We've looked to this and we've looked to that and we say, God, I can't let go of that. I can't let you truly have full control of this thing. I think of Jesus when he began to wash the disciples' feet. And he comes to Peter. And he says, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus told him, he said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And he said, Lord, not my feet, but my hands and my head also wash all of me. And there's people doing that in their lives today. They say, Lord, we want you. We want to follow you. We want to observe your teaching. But when he comes to wash you and point some things out in your life that needs some touching and that needs some cleaning up, 
You say, not that, Lord. Don't touch that. Do anything, but don't touch that. Often he requires these things to be laid down before him so that we can walk in that full obedience unto him. You see, Paul didn't let his life and his desires get in the way. No, but he allowed his life to be conformed to the gospel of Christ so that he may finish his course with joy. You know, the Bible says in one place, he said, Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Because if I preach this thing willingly, there is a reward that's given to me. It's my joy to bring this gospel out to you today. It's my joy to serve the Lord. One thing that the queen of Sheba saw and marveled when she come before Solomon to see the splendors of his kingdom, she said, happy are thy servants. Happy are the servants of the Lord who sell their life out to serve him no matter what affliction may touch their bodies. Let me tell you, it's quoted in Psalm 30, verse 5. The weeping may endure for a night. Joy cometh in the morning to each and every saint of God. You hold on in the midst of that trial and joy is soon to come in the morning. Thank God. Sometimes we just got to let go of what we've been holding so tight to. So that we can truly experience the joy and the peace that passes all understanding that God desires to give each and every single one of us. See, Paul never let any of these things move him. He never let pain hinder his praise. You said it. And as I was seeking the Lord a while back, he revealed to me the same thing that Paul understood right there. That there's always a purpose behind your pain. Always a purpose behind your pain. And I know that it's not popular to some people. But like I said, I was hungry for God and I wanted to know what he had to say about the matter. There are sects of Christianity that try to convince other people of sin or unbelief because they experience pain or sickness in their life. But as we see this doctrine just is not biblical in the least little bit. Time and time again we see faithful followers of God suffer pain and sickness. Think of Epaphroditus in the book of Philippians that it speaks of. And he was sick because he dedicated his life to the ministry of his saints that, that were there in Philippi. You think of, the, of when Paul speaks in the Bible of Trophimus that he left in Milton sick. But he was a saint of God. Sometimes we've just got to understand that there's a purpose behind our pain. Look at Jacob. After he wrestled with God, his thigh was out of joint and he halted up on it for the rest of his life. And no man in his right mind that I know would halt up on his thigh unless there was some form of discomfort involved in it. But you want to know what? That's okay because it's the like fashion and figure of how God never intended us to walk the same after we've come into contact with him anyways. There's always going to be a change in us. You see, the word of God tells us that we should walk in newness of life to mortify the deeds of the flesh, to crucify that old man with the lust and the affections of the flesh to the cross of Jesus Christ. Going back to Paul, God once told Ananias concerning Paul after he repented. He said, you go pray for him for he's a chosen vessel to bear my name before kings and the Gentiles and all of Israel. And I'll show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And people say, that's so strange, but if you want to fix your eyes upon something here today that I pray will encourage you, turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. And Paul wrote these words to give us understanding that I hope sheds some light and understanding upon some of the things that we have faced even maybe for many years. He said, but I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places, and many of the brethren in the Lord Get this, waxing confident by my bonds 
are much more bold to speak the word without fear. There was a purpose behind the pain and all of the persecution and all of the troubles and the trials that Paul endured so that we could have the same confidence to say that my trials could not hinder my praise. My trials could not stop the work of God from fulfilling itself through me. No matter what I face, it could not stop the Lord from fulfilling His will in my life because there is a purpose behind my pain. And Paul's pain would become, as it says, his pulpit to reach multitudes down the eons of time to us today. When I think of Joseph, I hear of so many people that are trying to make it into something that it's not. It's a good lesson. When Joseph tells his dreams and people will say, be careful who you tell your dreams to. They'll hurt you. But what I want you to see and what I believe that God desires for us to understand through Joseph's struggles is that regardless the haters, regardless the mockers, regardless the setbacks, regardless the trials, that well beyond our very perception of being blessed, if God be for us, who can be against us? There's nothing that he won't do. He would be in heaven and earth so that he can bring his will to pass in our lives as we submit ourselves to him. No matter what bump in the road the enemy throws your way, you continue to follow after God full speed like me. You might have some, I'm not saying that I do it for God all the time. I'm just saying the way that I drive my truck. Ask the wheel bearings, ask the ball joints, ask the very multiple parts, ask my wife. And no matter how many deer I hit, how many deer hit me? Still driving fast. God help me. The point that I look to make to you today is maybe the reason that you're experiencing the, the afflictions that you're facing right now is for the furtherance of the gospel in not only your lives, but the lives of all those around you as a testimony for others that they might draw confidence from God's work through you in the midst of their trial instead of falling into fear like so many people do. You know, people are watching us, saints of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, For we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, and I understand the context, but it's a truth today, that people are watching you. Like it or not, the eyes are on your walk. I read one time of a prophet of God named Daniel. He did nothing but serve God faithfully and people conspired wickedly and craftily against him, th had him thrown into the lion's den and the king was watching along with all the country and that king came to the, the mouth of the den of lions and he said, Oh, Daniel, is thy God whom you serve continually able to deliver you from the might of the lion? And somewhere, I don't know if he was close to the door or asleep on the lion that should have killed him. But he said, O oh, king, live forever. They've done me no hurt for the angel of the Lord has shut their mouths. There comes a day that the angel of the Lord, that God himself shall rain down from heaven and shut the mouths of the adversaries, the very afflictions that ravage our minds and our bodies. There will be a day. There will be. It's important we know who our afflictions work for. I like what it says in 2 Corinthians. It says, For our afflictions worketh for us a far more and exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Your afflictions are working for you. Paul, I'm about done. I know I'm long-winded. Paul was persuaded of a God who not only could, but would deliver 
And in 2 Corinthians 1, 9 through 10, he said, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves like so many are doing today, but in God, which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. He is a deliverer in our past, in our present, as he will be in our futures as we continue to press towards the mark of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Sorry. Psalm 18 is nothing more than a retrospect. I'm trying to get through all this, but I want to make a point to somebody. If I don't hit somebody with something, maybe something else will hit them. Lord willing, it's nothing that I do. But I know I've sought the Lord on this, and I believed it was a time, the time for the word. In Psalm 18, we see a retrospect of God's deliverance upon David. He fulfilled a promise for him over a period of years as David ran from Saul and reflecting upon all that happened in Psalm 18, he says in verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer. God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. You look at what he says there. However, in verses four and five, the sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Anybody ever been afraid? If you ain't raising your hand, you're a liar. You're a liar. I've been afraid before about a lot of things. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Then he does the right thing. Anytime that we feel these emotions or these insecurities or fears come upon us, he said, but in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. Then he said that he would do just that. As I mentioned, he shook heaven and earth to deliver me. He goes over in verse 16. He says, he sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. Anybody ever been drawn out from the, from the, from the trials that they wrestle with? I have. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity but the Lord was my stay. He'd go on over to say by thee I've ran through a troop. By thee I have leaped over a wall. And that's why I say to you today that your praise just like David's right here looking back. Some of your praise might be years in the making, but you look back upon the history of the God that we serve, how he takes things that were meant against us for evil and he turns it for good. He can do it for you today. Some of you are right on the brink of your breakthroughs and the distress of what you're facing is trying to prevent your praise, but you can declare this very day that the Lord is my stay. He's my deliverer. He's my defender. He's my strong tower. He's my refuge, my way maker, my provider. And praise God, he's more. He's my father. I know sometimes we bring the things upon ourselves. Anybody ever done that? Me too both hands but I know that sometimes the purpose behind our pain as I come to a close if they'd come to the piano somebody said amen thank God sometimes it's unbeknownst to us ain't it when I think of this I think of a man such as Job we, he didn't understand why he was facing the things that he that he was facing he was upright in all of his ways he eschewed evil far away from him. He followed God faithfully. And he said, I, I look before me and behind me. I look to my left and to my right and God's hiding himself from me. Why am I facing the things that I am today? I just don't understand. I've been there. But little did he know 
that behind his suffering, there was a purpose behind the pain. There was a purpose and an importance for him to remain faithful, just like for you and I, because just beyond the veil of his vision, there was a conflict concerning his worship. The devil said to God in the spiritual realm, he only praises you. Doth Job worship thee for naught? But if you would take down the hedge, if you would touch his family, bring death into that family, if you would take his health, if you would take his wealth, remove everything away from him, take that wife that he's got and cause her to, to speak as that foolish child and say, just curse God and die. It's too much for me to watch. She lost just as much as he did. And she was watching her husband suffer. But Job remained faithful because he understood the importance of serving God. And he, even under the afflictions of his adversary, as grievous as what they were, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The Lord gives and the Lord taketh away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. In sickness, I'm gonna praise him. In health, I'm going to praise him through hindrance, through hurt, through rain, through sun, through shine. Come what may, I'm going to bless the name of God. My worship's not going to wither with this mortal body. My praise will not be prevented by pain. And the fire that I face is only refining me because there is a purpose behind my pain. And most importantly... Jesus feels your pain. He feels your pain. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that we have a great high priest that knows exactly what it's like to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And you'd better believe that it wasn't painless for Jesus as he walked this earth. He felt the pain of those nails that was driven into his hands and into his feet. The crown of thorns that was beat into his skull. The weight of his body even possibly tearing muscles as he was lifted up on that old rugged cross. Those splinters stabbing into the already open wounds on his back. But all the while, he knew that there was a purpose behind the pain. That under every lash of the whip, his stripes would heal us. That reconciliation and forgiveness from sins was falling unto us, to mankind with every drop of blood that poured out of him as he hung on that cross. There's a purpose behind the pain. But I thank God that it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so also will the consolation. So also will the comfort. You're experiencing the weight and the grief of the trials, but he experienced the weight and the grief of the cross. And furthermore, our sins being cast upon him as God punished him for our sakes. There's a purpose behind the pain, but there's also everlasting life and a mansion to gain, amen. And oh, what a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see when he wipes every tear away. But you can know the deliverance of God now. You can be encouraged now. He can take you and shelter you from that enemy that seems greater than you can face right now. David said, I would have fainted if I had not seen the goodness of God in the land of the living. Don't let the pains of this life prevent your praise right now because some are just on the brink of their breakthroughs. You can be healed. Believe with me. We don't know if the Lord will heal you or not right now. I believe He wants to. But whether He does or whether He don't, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as we all stand around the sanctuary, we're not going to bow we're not going to give up. God can deliver me from the fiery furnace, but if he doesn't, we're still going to praise him. I know some of you are weary with the word. Much learning is a weariness of flesh, the word says. 
but don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you're going to reap if you faint not. The Bible says no time to faint, even with all the weight of the world and the sicknesses, the illnesses, the problems, the cares and concerns that are upon us. The way that the enemy makes us want to think that nothing's going to change, nothing's going to happen just like that. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. I believe in a God who can. Amen. Let's pray today. God knows. God already knows your heart. He already knows what you're struggling with. What a wonderful message, amen. But you got to know there's only one deliverer. There's only one deliverer. There's only one deliverer in the world. His name's Jesus. From all these things our brother brought out, he's the only one who can deliver you. He's the only one you can pull you through. He truly is that rock that is higher. He is that rock. And that's why God knew. That's why David wrote <laughs> that he ran to him. There's a place to go. There, there is a place to run to. There is a place to seek. There is a place. And that place, that person is Jesus. Come on. If you need pray, if you need pray, been struggling, you've been struggling, come on. Dude, I hope everybody here knows who Jesus is. Everybody here is saved and born again. Everybody here is ready, amen, to go to heaven. If you're not, you can be before you leave this place right now as God moves upon your heart. See, God the Father has to draw you to His Son, Jesus Christ. He might be doing that right now. God knows. God knows. Come on. Anybody, anybody, anybody else need to come pray? Come on. Come on. Come on. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Isn't it good, though? Isn't the Word good? Amen. The Word is good. Amen. Because God is good. And God brought forth the Word brought forth the word anybody else come on come on come on anybody else he loves you he loves you that's why that's why he brought all this that's why he did all this because he loves you amen come on anybody else anybody else as we tarry for a moment God speaking to your heart. God speaking to your heart. Nobody's going to make fun of you. Nobody's going to laugh at you. We're going to rejoice. We rejoice when people come pray. We rejoice when they come to get deliverance. We rejoice when they come trusting in God for their deliverance, for their help, for their hope for the forgiveness, for everything. We rejoice, we rejoice, we rejoice tonight in what God's doing in people's lives. Trust Him, trust Him, trust Him, trust Him. Trust is something you, you're going to have to learn to do. Trust is something you're going to have to learn to do in God. But the more you trust in Him, the more you're going to find that He is faithful. He is faithful. He's faithful. You might not always be faithful, but He's going to always be faithful. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Yeah, give the Lord a big hand, will you?